Amen. Well, wasn't that a powerful time of worship, declaring some of the truths of God? We want to welcome you. We're so glad you're here on this Canada Day weekend, and particularly to welcome those of you who are watching from home and joining us uh, in live stream. I hope your worship was as meaningful and powerful as it was here. Today, we just want to talk about truth. As we just sang some of the truths of God, we want to spend some time talking about truth because truth can be hard to believe at times, right? There are some truths that are difficult to believe. A sugar cube size piece of a neutron star, sugar cube size piece. Do you know how much that weighs? Just a sugar cube size piece of a neutron star, one billion tons, a sugar cube size piece. That's hard to believe, or right? Just that, that little bit. A lightning bolt, when it hits, it produces a temperature that's five times greater here on Earth than the temperature of the sun. One lightning bolt, when it strikes, five times greater. That just seems hard to believe. Or how many of you fearful of spiders, right? Worried about spiders, poisonous spiders, spider bites. You have a greater chance of being killed by a rogue champagne cork than you do with a spider bite, right? Everybody's ooh, afraid of spiders. No one's afraid of champagne. And yet you have a greater chance of being killed by it. Some truths are really hard to believe. And it's true when it comes to the truths about our Savior, the truths that we just sang, the truths about God. Some are hard to believe. And maybe you're here, maybe someone brought you here, maybe you're curious about Jesus or church. And what a great weekend to be here because this is an opportunity to really consider, is Jesus truth? Is he the truth? But maybe others of us are here in, in the battle, when we're in the arena of the battles of life, our struggle is about believing the truths of God. Does God really love me? Did Jesus really come? Did he die? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Has God forgiven me? Is God for me? Is he victorious? Does he hear my prayer? Will he answer my prayer? Will he answer in the way that I want him to? That a lot of us, we struggle with this battle about the truth. And that if we're on shaky ground sometimes in our faith, it's often because we're not sure. Is that true or not? Can I really trust what God says? And what we want to see today is that to stand firm in our faith, because this is what Paul is going to talk about, to stand firm in our faith, we have to exchange some of the negative and untruths in our life with God's truth. They have to exchange the negative, untrue thoughts with the truth about God. And we started last week this series we called In the Arena. We've called it about spiritual warfare, about being in the arena of life. And last week we saw that in the end of Ephesians, this letter that the apostle wrote, Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus, that he talks about a spiritual world, that he kind of pulls the curtain apart between the natural world and the spiritual world. And he says that we have face a battle, that we have an enemy, that we have an enemy that wants to destroy our faith, to take us out, to make us confused about God, who wants to weaken churches and destroy families. And Paul here reminds us that we live in a spiritual world and everything that's beautiful and good and wondrous, right, that in the spiritual it's world is created, it's governed by God but that everything that kind of is dark and bleak and, and evil, it's not just because there's maladaptive people in our world, it's because there's a presence of evil behind that. And that because of that, we face a battle, an ongoing struggle. And my guess is this week you felt some of that, that there's a struggle right, between right and wrong, a struggle of laying down some of your idols, a struggle of surrendering to God, maybe a struggle of believing to God, hearing God, listening to God. And someone last week, they said, hey, pastor, like, I don't like that term warfare or spiritual warfare or battle, like, that doesn't sound very Christianly, like, Paul wasn't writing to the Ephesians who were in a battle. Why would Paul use that term? I always talk about life as a battle. And it's a great question, and I think it's because of this, that often 
when it comes to faith and issues of faith, we think of it like working for McDonald's. Like, if I like working for McDonald's, I'm going to be there. If I like the food, I'm going to go there. If everything's okay and I agree with everything, it's okay. If I disagree with McDonald's and kind of agree with Wendy's a little bit more, then maybe I'll make a switch. But Paul here is saying that we're followers of Jesus, not just when we agree or because it feels good, but because we're surrendered to God. It's the truth. And that when we give ourselves to Christ, we kind of like a list, enlist to a different authority. And it's not about our preferences and our wants or like God's working for me here or there, but I'm completely surrendered. I'm all in. And it's with this desire that we be all in that Paul writes these words at the end of Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might and put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil that are in the heavenly places. So therefore, I want you to take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done everything, stand firm. So stand firm, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. And as Paul's writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, he's in the city of Rome, he's under house arrest, he's awaiting a trial, and there is a guard with him, a Roman guard, that's standing beside him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's constantly guarded. There's a guard that's given his life to the Roman Empire, and it doesn't, not because he prefers, and when the Roman Empire doesn't do what he likes, he's not going to leave, he's committed. And so Paul says, when we face the battles, he's looking at the soldier who's ready and prepared for battle because he's suited up. And Paul next is going to talk about six kind of pieces of armor. And for the next six weeks, we're going to look at each piece individually. And what we need to understand is what these pieces of armor are, that the armor of God is really the benefits, privileges, and freedoms that we have in Christ. It's the benefits, privileges, freedoms that we have in the gospel of Jesus. And that when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, it wasn't just so that, oh, you get a free ticket to heaven or your destiny, it's determined. It's that he could give us so much more, that we are new creations, we're new people. We have the power of the gospel. We have the presence of God's Holy Spirit. We are seated in the heavenlies. We have new authority in Christ. We are completely free, we redeemed. We have all these rights and privileges and freedoms. And Paul says, be ready, wear them. Every day that you get up, walk in those freedoms. And so the first thing he says is, I want you to put on a belt of truth. Now, the belt for the Roman soldier, it wasn't just to hold up his pants. It was used sometimes to pick up uh, the flowing garments that they wore and wrap them around so they could run quicker and they wouldn't be entangled by them. But the belt was the centerpiece of the armor. And the belt is the first thing that you would put on. And the belt, it would hold your scabbard, a small knife, and your sword. The breastplate, it would fit to it. If you didn't have the belt, all the other pieces of armor would fall off. And if you didn't have any, the belt, then you would really be weaponless and helpless. And Paul here is going to say the centerpiece of our life is truth. That if you don't know the truth of God, if you're not walking in the truth of Christ, if you're not close yourself in Jesus who is truth, you are a sitting duck for the enemy. You're helpless. The piece of armor, the belt, also it covered the most vulnerable part of people. In fact, if you look at a picture of the belt, there were these metal strips with metal discs that covered kind of the loins of the soldier. And because there's, there's children here, well, just be careful. It covered the most, like, vulnerable part of the soldier. And if you notice the King James Version, it doesn't say put on the belt of truth. It says gird up your loins, protect your loins. What are your loins? It's like where life comes from. 
And Paul says the truth has to seep deep into the very intimate parts of us, that it protects us. And you know what it's like when someone's lied to you or when you've been caught in a lie or when you believe something and found it untrue, right? How shameful you feel, how weak you feel, how embarrassed you feel. It, it, like, it, it goes to the inner core of who we us. And Paul says, put on this belt of truth, the centerpiece of who we are that protects the most vulnerable part and that it correlates in our Christian life to truth. And we have to put on truth. And truth in our culture, it really is this. It's defined as this. It's an objective standard by which reality is measured. This is what truth is. It's an objective standard by which reality is measured. It's something we know that is true. And I think you notice that some of the challenges we have are truth. What is truth? And Paul is going to say, if you're not walking in truth, you're vulnerable, you're open, you're defenseless, you're weakened. And Paul says, I want you to put on truth. So I invite you to do something just uh, in this moment. We're going to we're going to use these laters, but uh, uh, later I I know you're not supposed to use your phone in church, but I invite you to take out your phone if you're watching at home. Take out your phone. Participate with us, and I encourage you text us a truth about God to 647-695-1455. What's a truth about God that's helped you stand? What's the truth that you've said, this is, this is what I'm going to live for or die for. This is what I know about God. This is a truth that I go back to again and again. So text us those. We're going to use those a little bit later. But Paul says, put that on. Why? Because that's what we have. We are now people not walking in darkness or deceit, but we're people walking in truth and put on truth. Why? Because we have an enemy who wants to destroy truth. Last week, we looked at about six different strategies that Satan has in the arena to defeat us, and one is deception, that he loves to lie to us. And Jesus said this in the Gospel of John, John 8, verse 44, he said, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and notice what, he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And Jesus said, we all who live in the arena, who face these struggles and battles and warfare, are in the arena because we have an enemy who wants to lie to us, who does not want to walk us, want, uh, does not want us to walk in the truth, but to walk in deception or lies or defeat or equivocate, I don't know what's true. I don't know what to do. I don't know who I can trust. I don't know what I can do. That we have an enemy who's always attacking the truths about God. And that we have an enemy who attacks it. We need a belt of truth, first of all, because our society doesn't value the truth anymore. Right? We live in a world that doesn't think that truth is really important. We're culturally influenced to not face the truth. 2016, the Oxford Dictionary comes out with a word of the year. Every year, right, the, the Oxford Dictionary, they come out with kind of a new word. What's the word of the year? Do you know what the word of the year was for 2016? The word of the year was post-truth. Seven years ago, The word of the year was post-truth. What's post-truth? Post-truth, it says that we don't value situations or circumstances. We don't define things based on truth. We define them based on our feelings, based on our preferences, based on kind of what we like. That we've moved into a world where truth doesn't really matter as much anymore. And we wonder why we struggle with so many things. And now we live in a world where we don't expect politicians, right, to speak the truth. No one's really truthful. We don't turn on the news 
whether it's cable news or the internet um, or, or the radio, we don't turn on news for truth, right? It's commentary. Almost everything we listen to, it's, it's commentary. It comes through people's biases. And we wonder, why do we really know what's going on? Because we don't value the truth. What do we say to people? Well, find your truth. You have your truth, right? What's true for you is what's really important. We don't care about what's true. It's just like, if that's true for you, that's good. You find your truth. You live your truth. And we think somehow, oh, our world, it's really bad. Like, we've just gotten so far. Listen, though, to what Isaiah writes. And God, speaking through Isaiah, says about the culture of Israel 400 years before Jesus. In Isaiah 59, verse 14 to 15, it says, Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public square. In the public square, in the public forum, it's, there's no truth. No one stands firm on the truth. And uprightness, it can't enter. There's no truth, so there's no way to live right. Because when there's no truth, you're, what, you're vulnerable. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. And this is ultimately what Paul's saying. Put on, right, a belt of truth because it's what stands for, it's what's needed. You're a sitting duck. There's no way that you can live confidently if you don't have the truth. And a number of years ago, but maybe 50 or 60 years ago, we kind of moved from a true society to kind of the postmodern society where truth was not objective anymore. Truth is what? Relative. We've got all these decisions. Well, you make what kind of fits your truth. I'll make what kind of fits my truth. And this seeps into our relationship with God. Is it true? What's God? What's God like for you? Not who is God, but what he's really like for you. And we've forgotten that there are some truths that are objective, not relative. And when you go to the doctor... Right? You don't want the doctor to go, well, my preference is to kind of slice you here. Or I might feel better if I did this. You want a, a physician who's going to say, this is what the truth is, and this is what can happen. There is this clock in Colorado. It's the most accurate Nuclear timepiece there is in Colorado. Everything is measured by that clock. It keeps perfect time. That's what the best clock is. What it says is true. Now, if your grandmother gave you a watch, a pocket watch or an old watch, and that was the watch your grandparents wore time by, if that was the watch that meant a lot to them, and that watch is five minutes off the clock in Colorado, you don't say, oops, that clock's wrong. This watch is the truth. Right? This is what we do. We try to shape our lives to our truths instead of shaping our lives to God's truth. Or we try, right, to make the truth bend to fit our life. You can't say, oh, that clock in Colorado, it's, it's off. This is the time. I'm going to live by this time. Well, if you live by that time, you're five minutes off. There's truth. And friends, I think we've forgotten. There's truth, right? We look at signs like, oh, it's an objective truth. We say, oh, truth is anything you can find by science. But there are a lot of truths that are valuable, a lot of moral truths that may be harder to be defined by science, but they're true. Life has value. All life has value. We're made in the image of God. There are truths about morality and sexuality. It's true. Beyond our preferences. And we live in a world that society says, oh, you, don't, you just find your truth. We're also, to be honest, personally influenced not to face the truth. 
that the truth is hard. And a lot of times we don't want to talk the truth or face the truth because it costs us something. You know, when my wife comes home and she's been shopping and she puts the parcels on the counter and I ask, which unfortunately this is more about me, but my initial question is, oh, how much did that cost? Her answer is, it was on sale. <laughs> That's the first answer. Now, I hate to break it to you, but it was on sale isn't an answer to the question. The question was how much it costs. But it's on sale. Why do we say that? Because we're afraid of what might happen if we said the truth. Now, she shops for all the deal. It really is almost always on sale. I never worry about that. But we worry because the truth costs us something. Because if something's true, then something else is false. Something's false. And people don't want to live by faults or admit they're living by faults. Or to be able to speak the truth or live the truth or seek the truth of God, it may cost us somewhere. In the last dec previous decade, Lance Armstrong is one of the best um, bike riders in the, the world, racing cyclists. There, there were none, won a number of races. And there was one time that he was accused of using performance-enhancing drugs. And all these people are saying, oh, he's able to do what he does because he uses his performance-enhancing drugs. He took those people to court. He went to court to prove that he was not using performance-enhancing drugs. Because why? It would cost him. He would lose all his titles. He went to court. He proved his case. Everybody said, oh, the court says he's not using performance-enhancing drugs. He's okay. And then a couple years later, what happens? We found out he really was using performance-enhancing drugs. Lying about it the whole time. Ended up losing everything. He goes to court to try to prove that he wasn't lying, but he was lying because the truth costs us. And friends, sometimes the truths of God, it costs us. Submitting to the truth of God costs us. Oh, no, no, I just want my own little truth. It costs us. And we're spiritually influenced to not face the truth. Culture says, don't face the truth. We're personally, like, we don't want to face the truth because it hurts sometimes. And there's a spiritual force. In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5, the church, uh, when it was born, it was growing rapidly. And Jesus uh, rose from the, the dead. He sent his Holy Spirit. The church is just exploding. There are needs everywhere. People need help. Some people lost their job, alienated from their families because they came to Christ. And what happens is that people needed some resources. The church needed extra resources. And people would give to support the work of the church. And one of those who did was a man by the name of Barnabas. He had a piece of property he didn't need. He sold it, gave it all to the church and the apostles were like, oh, wow, you're such an encourager. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so there was another couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who, who thought, hey, this is a pretty good deal. We can kind of up our game. We can look a little better if, if we give something to the church. So they'd sold some property, laid the money at the apostles' feet and, and said, hey, we sold property and this is it. Now, they didn't have to do that. But what they did is they said, we sold the property. Here's all the money. Look at us. Pat ourselves on the back. How good we are. And when the church found out that they had only given part of the money, it wasn't a problem. They, the problem wasn't that they get part of the money. The problem was that they lied about it. And Peter said in Acts 5, verse 3, Ananias, notice, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself, part of the proceeds of the land. The problem is they lied. Why has Satan, this is in the arena, why has Satan moved in your heart to lie, not just to God, but to the Holy Spirit, lie to God? And in the arena, we face lies of all sorts, that Satan lies to us about our value. Right? A lot of us, if you're in the arena, my guess is many times the struggle is, is, am I valuable? Am I important? Am I good enough? What can I do? Does God love me? Does God see me? Does God know me? Does God even like me? 
And the enemy always wants to get us to question our value, but Jesus, who is the truth, right, he tells us who we are. He says, my son or daughter, God says, in whom I'm well pleased. You are formed in the image of God. You are his masterpiece. When you give your life to Christ, you're adopted into a new family. You have a new home. You have a new position. You're seated in the heavenly. Those are the truths. The problem is the enemy gets us to look at the lies. Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't feel that. I, I know that's what the Bible says, but I don't know if that's true. And it gets us to look at the lies. It would be just as if you were at the circus and you were looking in one of those mirrors. You know, sometimes there's mirrors that make you look really tall and thin or kind of short and squatty or mirrors that distort the image. And a lot of times, Christians are looking in the distorted mirror. They're looking at the life and the lie that Jesus or that Satan gives us. Oh, you're no good. You're nothing. You're of no value. And people feel defeated because that's all they see is the lie. And I know people, workaholics, right, destroy their family because they work all the time, all the time. Well, I don't work enough, right? The lie is, I'm only valuable if I work. I know people almost died with anorexia, right, because they listen to the lie that, that they're not thin enough. Right, people who have like blown their whole family because they drink every day. Oh, I'm not an alcoholic. It's not destroying me. I can control it. The enemy loves to lie to us about us. He also loves to lie to us about other people. Remember, Paul says, our wrestle is it's not against flesh and blood, it's it's against powers and principalities. And many times we wrestle with people because the, the enemy is lying to us about them. Many years ago, no, not here, it was somewhere else, I, I, a, this person came to me and they said, hey, hey, pastor, what have I done? Why are you angry with me? And to be honest, I hardly knew them. And I'm like, I'm not angry with you. Why would you think I'm angry? And they're like, well, last week at church, you walked right past me in, in, in the lobby uh, uh, during the coffee time, and you didn't smile or didn't say hello. And I'm like, I was probably on a mission, and I probably didn't say hello to hundreds of people. But they thought, oh, it's me and them. Right? The enemy wants to serve us in our marriages with our kids. Oh, this is what they're thinking. This is what you've done. He takes the lies about us, adds the lies about relationships, and, and then he lies to us about God. Right? And this was Satan from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say this? Did God really do that? Jesus in the wilderness, oh, just turn this to bread. Oh, God will save you if you do something stupid like jumping off a, a, a tower. And there's lots of lies. Oh, there are many ways to God. God changes with the times. Or I have my Jesus and your Jesus. I, I don't get that frame. Like, my Jesus would never do that. Right? You see people, my Jesus would not do that. Is that just your recreated Jesus or is that Jesus? You know, it's like when you take your, your kids to school and the teacher says, oh, well, your child did this or this or, or did that. And what do you say? My child would never do that. Well, actually, your child did. Because <laughs> we don't want to face the truth. And he lies to us, right, about God. He lies to us about others. And he lies to us uh, about ourselves. Spurgeon says this, I, I think it's such a great quote, that discernment is not figuring out right from wrong. Discernment is figuring out almost right from right. Discernment is trying to figure out almost right from right. That the enemy often takes kernels of truth about ourselves or about God or, or about others and, and blows them up. And that our job, why we need a belt of truth, 
is to serve. You know, we sometimes are too smart to know right from wrong or, or, or good from evil, but it's like almost good and good, almost right and right. So what do we do? How do we put on the belt of truth? How do we do that? Three quick things as we get ready to close. The first is that we have to desire to learn the truth. Like, where are you getting truth from? I think this is the question for today. Where do you look for truth? Where does truth come from for you? Right? Are you looking at at truth in cable news? Are you looking at truth online? Are you looking at truth in, in philosophy? Where are you looking for truth? And how true is your source of truth when you look for it? Instead of going to God for truth. Jesus, uh, in the upper room the night before he died, he says this in John 16, 13. He says, when the spirit of truth comes... He will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but ever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. This is why we talk about the importance of having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, walking with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's role in our life is to lead us to truth. Are you partnering with him? Are you saying every morning, hey, Spirit of God, lead me into truth. Hey, Spirit, help me to discern today almost right from right. And developing that relationship with him and partnership with him, it's so true. And part of how the Holy Spirit teaches us is that he teaches us through his word. In the next chapter, John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them. He's speaking about us, his disciples and us. Sanctify them in the truth because your word is truth. Your word is truth. And where do we find truth? It's in his word. And we have to decide what is true. Not just what's kind of true, but what is true. And the more you're in his word, the more you'll be able to stand and understand what's truth and what's a lie, what's almost true and what's not true. And in September, we're going to start some courses uh, just for a month. We're just going to take a break and and do some courses in the midweek. And and one of those courses is just how to read and understand the Bible. How do you read it for yourself and know that there's truth in there? And friends, this is so important because... What I see sometimes is that people, like, they get excited. They come to church because church makes them feel good. Or, or, or they come to church because they meet some nice people. Or, or they come to church because it seems to work for them for the moment. And they don't come to Jesus because he's true. And the good news, the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus came and died for our sin, paid the price for our sin, and rose again to give us life and freedom and and, and priorities and to give us his Holy Spirit, we either we have to decide, is that a preference or is it true? And if it's a preference, it's not going to work. We don't live for a preference. The disciples, they did not die For a preference, they died because Jesus was true. They knew him. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then our faith is in vain. It's worse. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, if he did not do what he said he did, then Christianity is the worst of all religions. It's the biggest lie. And today, you may decide, are you living for a preference? Are you living because, oh, it just feels good, or it's kind of nice, or I meet nice people? Or are you a follower of Jesus because he's true? And if you don't know, speak to us. We'd love to talk to you about why we know it's true, why we can trust him. And if you're here today and it's like, yeah, Christian, it just feels good, we want to talk to you. Let's show how it's true because you're not going to be able to stand in the arena of the battles of life based on feelings and preferences is that Jesus is true. Secondly, we put on the belt of truth because we want a desire to live truthfully. The word in, in, in Greek for, for truth, it really speaks of being truthful, truthfulness. 
And that in the arena, if if we're dealing with lies, if we're not honest, if we're deceitful uh, in our life and our practices and with other people, then we're going to fall prey to every battle. And maybe today what the Spirit of God is saying, hey, you've got to put on your big boy or big girl pants and you've got to face the truth. You've got to stop deceiving. Because maybe you wonder, why does God seem so distant? Are you lying to others and lying to God? Why is Satan trying to get you to lie to God? Is there something in your life that's deceitful? And maybe, you know, we all are sinful. John says, hey, if we claim that we're without sin, if any of us say, oh, we're perfect, we got this Christian life down, he says, you're a liar. The goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to live authentic lives in front of God to be truthful. And thirdly, we put on the belt of truth, and this is so hard, because we have to change our desire, that we have to desire to feel the truth. Because here's what happens. We may say, oh, I know the Bible says this, but I don't feel it. And a lot of times we struggle to believe something, why? Because we don't feel it. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel right. I don't feel like I'm in that place. And there's a lot of times... Sorry, there's a lot of times I don't feel like being a parent today, right? And there's probably some days I don't feel like being your pastor today. I just kind of want to go do my own thing. There's lots of things we don't feel. But we don't live based on our feelings. Paul says, put on truth. He doesn't say, put on the belt of good, nice feelings. He says, the centerpiece is truth. And so sometimes the biggest challenge we have is making our feelings, putting them in line with the truth. And how do we do that? We have to exchange the lies and the negative things with the truth. And as we go through this series, we'll talk more. But Paul says in in Corinthians that we have to kind of take every thought captive, every feeling thought, every lie, every deceit, take it captive, kind of throw it at the foot of the cross and replace it with the truth. Because a lot of times we don't feel like, oh, I don't feel God loves me today. I don't feel like I'm forgiven. I don't feel like I'm a new person. We have to preach it to ourselves. Now, earlier you sent in some, some texts, some things that you said uh, were true. And uh, here are some of those things uh, that you said to us. Um, you said that one truth is that God is the only one who can truly satisfy me. Uh, everything else in this world will fail me. Um, that God is the only one who can truly satisfy. Everything else will fail. So, and so when you don't feel satisfied, right? I don't feel full. God satisfies me. The other ones, we are God's workmanship. Right? We're God's masterpiece. That's what the word means. Paul in Ephesians says, I'm God's masterpiece. He's working on you. Right? The enemy makes you think you're junk and you're flawed. God says, you're a masterpiece. Who are you going to believe? Because we look in the funny mirror. We see the flaws. God sees the masterpiece. Someone else said, I'm a daughter of the king, and he has a plan for my life. I'm a daughter of a king. Right? I'm a person. I'm chosen. I'm in him. God has a plan. He didn't create you just to do nothing. He's got a plan. Someone else said that he is a loving and forgiving God even when I fail him. Right? Because that's what the enemy says. Right? We feel, oh, I've, I've lost it. I don't know how many people sometimes I, I meet with and they're like, of all the sinful people in the world, I'm the greatest and I'm like the, like I'm the one person right, that God can't forgive. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive them. He's a loving and forgiving God even when we fail him. And 2,000 years ago, Jesus stepped into this world, stepped into this battle, into the arena, and he didn't come with a sword. He's going to return with a sword, but he came with servants close, and he was obedient, and he surrendered to the cross to bring us truth. And today you have to decide, is Jesus true? 
And if he's true, are you going to live by feelings or by truth? And are you committed to drinking, not from wells of post-truth, but wells of truth? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Jesus. And if you're here today and are listening in and you've never given your life to him, maybe today's the day to say, hey, God, I, I, I feel like I'm faltering in the arena and all the different battles I face with people and others. And Jesus, I want you to know you as truth. I want to live for truth. Lord, I want to replace the lies that have been plaguing me with the truth of who you are. So Jesus, I know you lived and you died and you rose again. That's true. And Lord, help me to base and build my life on that. And God, I just pray that all of us, that Lord, in the arena and in the battles, that we would take every feeling, every negative thought, every lie captive and replace it with the truth of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I invite us just to pray for this prayer of protection over us this week. Heavenly Father, we just want to pray that we would be able to live and walk in your truth. Would we not be susceptible to the deceit and lies of the enemy, but would your truth be the center place of our lives? Help us to see our faith as truths, not just feelings or preferences, so that we can stand firm in them every day. And Father, thank you for this truth that you loved us and sent your only son Jesus to give his life for us. Thank you that when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us. Thank you that we are chosen children of God, masterpieces recreated in your image. Thank you that we're called and equipped to go after the righteous desires you put in our hearts. Thank you that we are named not by what people say, but we're named by you, that we are more than conquerors in Christ, that you will help us fight the good fight for what matters most. Thank you that when we walk in your truth, we can stand firm. And help us, Lord, to stand firm even when the day is evil. In Jesus' name, amen. All week. We have a daily text that goes to you just to help you stand firm in the arena. If you're not receiving those, you're missing out. On the screen behind me is a number you can just text ARMOR to, and we'll send you those texts every day. Make sure you've signed up for those. May God go with you as you fight the good fight, and may you wear his belt of truth. God bless.